Hello friends in YouTube land. This is Dr. Reeves back with another neurology special. I want to talk about vertigo and I want to talk about sort of how to talk about vertigo with your doctor. Um, first is a definition and it sounds a little bit odd but uh, there's a, a, some rationale behind it. Vertigo is a hallucination of movement. A hallucination of movement. Hallucination means a sensory perception which is not reflected in the outer physical world. And we often talk about hallucinations like you know seeing things that aren't there uh, or hearing things that aren't there. Well this is a, vertigo technically is a hallucination which is experiencing or sensing a movement that is not there. Uh, most common kind of vertigo, which we'll talk a little bit more about, is rotatory vertigo, rot rotational, this spinning. But that's not the only kind of vertigo. So definition of vertigo, a hallucination of movement. That is to be differentiated from other disorders of equilibrium, shall we say. Um, one, the very common one, is what we often call lightheadedness. Most people have had the experience of they're lying down and they stand up, and they say, well, I stood up too quickly and I kind of got this feeling in my head. And sometimes even people will say that their, their vision changed a little bit. But lightheadedness is a feeling that if it got a lot, lot worse, you could pass out. With vertigo, people do not pass out. They often wish they would because the feeling is so bad. But that's different from lightheadedness. Um, little sidebar on lightheadedness, though. Uh, the most common cause of lightheadedness is people get up quickly, their blood pressure drops. And some people will say that uh, your blood pressure dropping, and a little caveat, please see the video on orthostatic hypotension. But some people will say that blood pressure dropping does not cause vertigo. It cannot cause vertigo. They are wrong. Sometimes, not super common, but it does happen that sometimes someone will drop their blood pressure enough that they will actually get vertigo because of its effect on part of the nervous system, which part we're going to get to later. So there's vertigo, the hallucination of movement, lightheadedness, often like, like I, could, I could faint if this got worse. And then there are various types of uh, incoordination or imbalance. Um, for example, if people drink too much alcohol, which we should not do, uh, we may walk and move with imbalance. There are people who have that same kind of imbalance, and our fancy word for that is ataxia. There are people who have ataxia, not because of too much alcohol, but because they have a neurologic problem, or they've had a stroke, or they've had uh, some other issue affecting those circuits, and they have imbalance. They cannot be steady as they walk or even sometimes as they stand. That's not vertigo, that's imbalance of a different kind. So, next topic. Something important to understand. Vertigo is not a disease. Vertigo is a symptom, it is a description. Uh, saying someone suffers from vertigo is like saying they suffer from shoulder pain. That's a who and a what and a where. Okay, there's pain, my, shoulder. It doesn't tell you anything about why it hurts. It doesn't tell you anything about why the person has vertigo. Now, often we classify disorders and diseases based first on the why. Like, they have an infection and then we say, well, where the infection is comes, comes later. Uh, but in the case of vertigo, it's very helpful actually to separate it a little bit differently. And for, at this point, it would be helpful to have some items for a visual aid. If only we had a jar of Mrs. Reeves' famous Bing Cherry Jam. My goodness, will you look at that? We happen to have one. It would be nice if, oh, if we had some string. So let's cut a little piece of string off for our fancy visual aid. And if we only had something else, oh, well that'll do. It's humidifier water treatment. Work with me here. It's high tech. The Bing Cherry Jam is my inner ear. It has specialized Bing Cherry receptors in there that sense movement. So when I turn my head, 
or I go like this or something. There are sensors in this that say, hey, we're, we're moving, and it communicates that information somewhere else. And we're going to get to the somewhere else. This is the inner ear, the vestibular apparatus, and it's not in the brain, okay? It's outside the brain, and so we call this a peripheral organ. And you, the term that you hear a lot is peripheral vertigo. And, and it, it's all based on the where. So this apparatus, in a sense, it acts a lot like the little apparatus in your, if you have a cell phone that can tell what position it's in, does the same kind of thing. Most of the electronics in here are set up to detect rotation of one flavor or another, but other, not all of them. Some are set up to detect linear acceleration, going this way or going this way, or maybe even going to one side, but particularly front and back. So you can have a vertigo that is not spinning. You can have an, uh, I call it acceleratory vertigo. And these patients will come in and they'll say, sometimes I feel like I'm tumbling or I'm being pushed forward or being pushed backward when it hits me suddenly. It's still vertigo because it's a hallucination of movement. This fancy electronic Bing Cherry apparatus has to communicate with the central computer, the brain, and it does that through first the brain stem. So here's our peripheral vestibular apparatus. It's got a nice fancy nerve that it uses to communicate to the brain stem. So the brain stem. Now imagine the rest of the brain, I guess, is on top. I didn't have a pumpkin to put up here, so work with me. When I turn my head, the circuits in here send signals along the nerve to the brain stem, which carries them, processes some, uh, somewhat, and then sends the, the information to the rest of the, of the brain. And I experience the feeling of movement. From here out is peripheral. From here in is central, central nervous system, brain stem, and the invisible brain here. Most of the time that I see a patient with vertigo, like 97% of the time, it's peripheral. It's, in a sense, it's not really even neurologic, and I'm a neurologist. This is susceptible to several problems. We can talk about the kinds of problems a little bit later. This is susceptible some other, to some other kinds of problems. This has different problems. Peripheral vertigo can be severe. It can really knock you for a loop. Um, but ultimately, it won't kill you. The problems that cause central vertigo are some bad actors. Strokes, uh, bleeds in the brainstem, or sometimes elsewhere. Um, certain uh, other kinds of uh, inflammatory disorders and inflammation and that kind of stuff in the central nervous system. Those are bad. Okay? So central vertigo is a bad thing. Peripheral vertigo is a bad thing, but it generally isn't going to kill you. It's just going to make you miserable. So the first division, kind of, somebody has vertigo, yes or no, oh, they have vertigo. The next division is, does this look like it's central or does this look like it's peripheral? Because if it's central, we have to be worried about bad actors and a certain list of bad actors. If it's peripheral, which most of them are, fortunately, uh, we have to worry about a, another list of bad actors. So let's talk a little bit about some of those bad actors and some of the things that we find with cases of central vertigo and peripheral vertigo. And we're going to focus on peripheral vertigo. When you have peripheral vertigo, there are several observations that people may often see. Um, one is a phenomenon of, uh, that we call fixation suppression. And people with peripheral vertigo will come in sometimes. They'll come in, they'll tell me, uh, Dr. Reeves, you know, I get when, when the vertigo hits me, if I stare really hard and concentrate on a spot, I, I feel a little bit better. When you have an attack of vertigo, particularly peripheral vertigo, your inner ear is sending to your brain the message, hey man, we're spinning like crazy, or we're tumbling, or whatever it is, usually spinning. Your brain checks with your eyes, and your eyes say, no we're not, what are you talking about? And the brain has terribly conflicting input. The net result is we tend to throw up. 
And so sometimes if you focus on the visual system, you can kind of somewhat dampen what the inner ear is getting into the brain. And the brain said, you're sort of telling the brain, don't pay attention to the inner ear. He's crazy. Okay, so fixation suppression, a little more common with uh, 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 inner ear. The inner ear disorder, in, the inner ear uh, electronics, if you will, is designed to sense changes in position. And so it's much more likely with peripheral vertigo that someone is going to say, well, you know, when I'm in this position, you know, I'm not too bad, but by golly, when I roll over or something like, oh my, oh my word, that really gets me. I just, my, and if, if I get back over here, then I'm okay. So peripheral vertigo is rather more position dependent. Peripheral vertigo also tends to fatigue more quickly. Not that you, you get tired of vertigo because that's, that happens really quickly. Uh, but, but rather, if you, if you do something that makes, brings on the vertigo and you kind of keep doing it a little bit and a little bit and a little bit, it's, it sort of wears out a little bit. It sort of fatigues somewhat. Uh, you don't tend to see that as much in, in central vertigo, and you don't tend to see central vertigo causing a real position-dependent vertigo problem. Um, the, the, the funny thing is, I, mean, I mentioned some things that cause central vertigo, kind of the strokes and whatnot, and I haven't even talked about the most, what causes some of the most common things in the peripheral vertigo. Uh, clearly, and this is easy to read up on and to watch uh, videos on, there's, there's the so-called crystals in the ear, the otolith, uh, the canolith, the, these little calcium chunks that are on the tips of the little, uh, they call them hair cells, they're like antennas uh, with little rocks at the end, and they get, they get off and they get in the, wedged in the wrong place and, and they cause terrible vertigo. That's a really common cause. Um, tends to be intermittent. Um, whenever I see a case of that, I will tell the person, uh, well, kind of good news is, the bad news is you have vertigo. The good news is it's not a stroke. Um, the good news is it's, it's going to get better. The bad news is you're going to get it again. But the uh, middle of the road news is I don't know, you don't know, and nobody knows if you're going to get it again in two weeks, two months, or 15 years. And nobody knows if the next attack is going to be worse than this one or milder than this one. You just don't know. But once that process tends to start, the little calcium chunks getting knocked free, getting wedged down between some of these receptors, and just telling your brain like mad, oh, we're moving, we're spinning, it tends to recur at times. A very common story with that will be, I was minding myself, I was sitting there, lying in bed and I just rolled over and all of a sudden the world went right or I was lying in bed or sitting or lying on the couch or doing something I sat up or I, or I laid back and just suddenly it hit me. Central vertigo tends not to have repeated episodes like oh I had this two years ago and then I had it a little bit nine months ago and then I got it really bad this week. Okay that's not a story really for central vertigo because the things that cause central vertigo tend to come and stay and leave damage that's not good. Peripheral vertigo very much an on and off type of thing. There are other causes of peripheral vertigo. You could uh, study up on superior canal dehiscence syndrome and such. There's uh, 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 drugs which can cause peripheral vertigo and there's some drugs that cause central vertigo too. <coughs> camera girl had to sneeze. Mm -hmm. We haven't talked about the, the nerve, the eighth cranial nerve, the vestibular nerve that, that goes, carries impulses from here to there. Yes, if you have a problem affecting this, you can get vertigo. Um, benign growths, benign tumors can, can press on that and cause, cause problems. Uh, by no means is this a, can, uh, am I intending to shoot a comprehensive video about every stinking thing that can cause vertigo. Can't do it. Not going to do it. But I want you to have a vocabulary to talk with your physician about vertigo, to understand why he or she is going to uh, have their mind go down this pathway of, well, is this central, something that can really hurt you, strokes, I mean, they, they kill you, they, they can paralyze you, all kinds of bad things. Or is this peripheral, 
something that will make you miserable, it probably is going to be manageable in the long run. And what tests do we need to use to be able to figure out the two? Now I'm going to teach you something about that latter thing. Um, and a fair number of doctors don't know this test. Uh, I didn't invent it, so I'm taking no credit. It's called the Head Impult, Impulse Test, H-I-T, Head Impulse Test. It has a few other names. Basically goes like this. If you look at something and then somebody turns your head sharply to one side, like this, okay? But if you're just keeping your eyes fixed on that, someone comes up and turns your head sharply, your eyes will stay on that. And it's really very fast. So I'm going to use my hands as eyes. Pardon me, brainstem, inner ear, bing cherry. So when we turn the head rapidly to the left, the eyes snap to the right very quickly. When we turn the head to the right, and if there's a problem on the right, in the right inner ear, a peripheral problem, you tend to see this. There's a delay. So you turn, you know, somebody moves the head, and you literally, you have to go up and kind of get them to loosen their neck, and you say, okay, I'm going to twist your head real quickly here. Keep your eyes on, on the tip of my nose, and sort of you jerk the head to the one side, and pull our uh, eyes do this, jerk to the other side, and they go, there's that lag. That is a a um, not sure fire, there's no 100% accurate test, but it's a highly, highly suggestive test. This is probably peripheral. And that can be very reassuring. And if you think about that test, uh, it's really kind of nice because it's very reassuring and it's pretty cheap. It's not like an MRI scan. When we do MRI scans, by the way, for vertigo, usually we're, we're trying to make sure that there's no, no stroke in the brain stem or something like that, and that, that the piece of string doesn't have any tumor growing on it or something like that. The inner workings of the inner ear, where those little crystals are and that kind of stuff, you can't see on the MRI. Well, hopefully this has been of some use to think about vertigo, to talk about vertigo with your, your healthcare providers. And any comments, um, happy to, to uh, look at them. I don't check every day, but I will eventually check. So good help to you all. Thanks.